Hello and welcome and thank you for joining me for my talk on the anatomy of a COVID patient. My name is Dr Pip Garner. I'm a lecturer in anatomy and physiology as part of the clinical sciences team at the University of Bradford. So this is me on one of my uh, very rare occasions I got to go for a walk myself this lockdown because usually I am followed by my two amigos, my two little whirlwinds, my sons. So I am a lecturer but I'm also a mummy. So my talk's about anatomy, but what is the study of anatomy? So, <clears throat> by the wonders of modern technology, I am giving you this talk while simultaneously also manning the chat function. So, at any point in this talk, if I ask any questions, you know, you don't have to join in, but if you do want to type anything in the comments box or ask me any questions, then I can answer as we go through that function. So, like I say, do you have any ideas of what is anatomy? Maybe a definition or what you think you might study if you're studying anatomy or the kind of words that may come to mind. Give you a couple of seconds. Okay, so when I have done this before with my students and I've asked them what is anatomy, I get answers like structure. So what what shape something is, how it connects to something else. I might get words like dissection, and that's true. So actually having something like a human body, um, if we want to study the anatomy, we can open it up and have a look. Um, sometimes we just look at the body in pieces. We sometimes don't even look at it all in one go. Um, you may have also given me answers actually naming some of the things we might look at. So bones, I am a huge fan of skeletons. You'll see that as we go through this, the beginning of this talk. But also things like organs, heart, brains, we're also going to come across those in this talk. Um, things like blood vessels, again, they feature as well. But also things like nerves. Okay, so you may have thought about all those things. So yes, anatomy is the study of the human body by looking at the structure and understanding the structure in terms of what it does. So structure and function. So really, this talk's going to be anatomy and physiology, which is the fancy science term for thinking about how the body functions. And I'm going to put that in the context of disease and in particular this COVID-19 that we are all very much aware of at the moment. And does anyone know who these two people are? So this individual on the left, so this orangey coloured picture, this is an attributed self-portrait. So the clue for this individual is he's also an awesome artist. You will no doubt know some of the pictures he has painted. The gentleman in the middle is lesser known. However, in terms of anatomy and driving forward the rebirth of anatomy that happened in the Renaissance, so about 600 years ago, he's sort of almost more important than Leonardo da Vinci. Um, oh, I've given it away. So yes, the first individual is Leonardo da Vinci. The second individual is Andreas Vesalius. And he is also an amazing artist. So I think this is one of the reasons why I like anatomy, because it, it's science combined with art. And these are the kind of images that he produced. And Andreas Vesalius put together all these images and combined his anatomical knowledge and published a series of books in the 16th century, the, the Humani Corpus Fabrica Libri Septum. I really apologise for anyone that speaks Latin because that was probably a horrific pronunciation. But essentially these became the, the anatomical sort of textbook for a lot of study of things like medicine for quite a, a while after the Renaissance and really did lay the groundwork for the modern study of anatomy. But talking of the modern study of anatomy, obviously we still do body dissections. If people are lucky enough to have access to a dissection room, um, they are fascinating places. I loved studying in there as a student and I love studying there as a teacher and showing other people. However, in this digital age, we have other tools at our disposal as well. So we might use images like this. So this comes from a computer program that you can use to study anatomy. And unlike a real body where, you know, you might not want to see everything and you might want to see some of the deeper down structures. And it might actually take you many, many days to do the dissection to get to the part you want. 
in computer models, you just click a few buttons and it removes the pieces. So for example, here in this picture, we still have the heart in place, we have the intestines, we have the bladder, but I've had it remove things like the liver and the stomach to see the, the deeper down structures. You can also hear that we've got the blood vessels, these tubes, the blue and red tubes, and the yellow, very fine things that you can see dotted around this image are the nerves. So this is one way we can study now. We also have these kind of awesome tools. So this is MRI imaging, so something you might find in the hospital. So this is someone who was having a brain scan and we can recreate these images together to almost make like a video where you go down into someone's body. So this is showing you that now if we, if we need to understand someone's personal anatomy, we don't actually have to dissect them anymore. We can use things like medical imaging and I'm gonna show you some medical imaging to do with the COVID talk as well and we can see what's happening inside someone's body without having to dissect them. Because if we want the person to be alive at the end of the treatment, dissecting them is not always how we want to do things. So medical imaging is definitely a bonus. When it comes to teaching anatomy in somewhere like a university, we also have tools like this anatomage table. Um, so at Bradford, <clears throat> we do still study um, bodies in places like the University of Leeds but we also have our own digital technologies that we use so uh, my colleague Dr Belby Clark as part of the catalogue of events that the, the museum's putting on for this festival we've offered a virtual tour to do with our digital anatomy teaching so you might want to have a look at that as well. Okay, but I don't think anatomy is just for university. I'm a great believer in studying anatomy and anatomy being for the whole family I did say I liked skeletons. You'll get this idea more and more. So you can see I've got my t-shirt on and I actually decided that I was in the Manchester Velodrome and I would have Ed Clancy, the Olympian, sign my baby skeleton. This is my youngest at Halloween. Again, skeleton images. And my eldest helping me practice for some teaching. So he was going through, I believe that's an ulna and a radius of the forearm. He was helping me teach that. During lockdown, we also got the chalks out and as well as drawing rainbows and tigers and all everything else, I decided to get embrace the fact that anatomy is art and we were doing things like the heart on the paving stones as well. My eldest also loves jigsaws, so we, there are some really cool sort of anatomy type jigsaws and things out there as well that you can get for kids. Okay, but I digress. Back to my talk. I just wanted to know that... You, let you know what I mean when I talk about the anatomy of a COVID patient and some of the sort of tools that I'm going to use as we go through to have a look at that. So my interest in this sprung from the fact that something that should be a respiratory disease is affecting the whole body and the legacy of this disease now is people that are still being affected a long time after the COVID symptoms have gone. So there's this disease, like I say, it's named, and I'll show you in a minute how, how it's named, for something that should just be affecting the lung, is clearly affecting other body, sim uh, other body organs. And I wanted to know how, how is it, well, how is it affecting, as in what the changes are in someone's body if we have a look, but also begin to look at um, what's going on in terms of the altered function of the body, so what changes have gone on, but also to think about how those people are now being treated, because we didn't expect this respiratory virus to cause such problems. So we have had clinical challenges. So if I put my clinical sciences hat on, as that is the programme that I teach on, I'm looking at anatomy and physiology, but thinking about how this person can be treated in the healthcare system that we currently have. So I also want to have a look at some of the unexpected challenges our healthcare system are still trying to meet as well, and also thinking about the legacy. So the, the implications moving forward for the treatment of this disease. So the anatomy of a COVID patient. So I'm not looking at one individual patient. However, I have a couple of examples of people. I want to show you 
to sort of really drive home the fact that this is affecting people long term. So I don't know if anyone know who this couple are. So if you want to write in the comments, see if you can guess. She is arguably going to be more famous within the general populace than he is. So she is Kate Garraway. So she's a television presenter on Good Morning Britain. And this is her husband, Derek Draper. He was involved in sort of politics. Um, he's 53 years old and it's actually him that I want to draw your attention to because in late March, just after lockdown, he sadly was diagnosed with coronavirus and he was rushed into hospital because of the severity of his symptoms. Come early April, he was in the ICU and he was fighting for his life. Um, the decision was taken to put him in a medically induced coma because they thought that was the best way to treat him because so many of his body systems were affected. Now, he was taken out of that coma about 10 weeks later, say about, because I'm, I'm going off a lot of media sources to do this at the moment, and they have slightly conflicting dates and things, especially from between July and now as to what's actually happening with this gentleman. Um, but he was taken out of the coma, but sadly he did not start recovering very well. So as of early September, there was lots of media coverage again because it was their anniversary and he was still in a condition where he was in hospital. He still couldn't particularly talk. And when sort of the, the stories were coming out about the damage that was done to Derek's body, we were looking at MRI showing holes in his heart, his liver was affected... His pancreas, now that's a, an organ within the, the digestive system that I'm going to show you. It's situated very close to the stomach and it's involved in um, blood sugars. And if your pancreas doesn't function, a certain part of your pancreas, then you can get diabetes. Now, Derek started off with no diabetes and is now expected to be severely diabetic because his pancreas was so dysfunctional, it wasn't working. Um, he also had to spend a lot of time on dialysis while they were treating him as his kidneys stopped working. So the job of the kidneys is to help filter the blood and take out all the poisons. And if that doesn't happen, you can be put on a machine called a dialysis machine, which will start um, purifying your blood for you. His nerves and the neurology of his system, so his brain, was also affected. That can be seen by the fact that he was in a medically induced coma, but then when they took him out of the coma, he still hasn't recovered fully. Um, like I say, he's not believed to be talking. Okay, so Kate is quoted as saying he has damage everywhere. And some of the doctors were quoted as saying that he's one of the sickest patients to actually survive. But you could say, and this gentleman had no underlying health problems. You could argue he's potentially slightly overweight and obesity has been seen to be um, more of a risk factor for this disease. But other than that, he shouldn't have been this unwell. But he is, a, thankfully, fairly rare as in the extreme damage that has been done to his body and his such uncertain recovery pathway. However, someone else that you might know, especially if there's families watching. So Dr. Zander. So this is the gentleman on the left. This is him also in this mask. So he's one of the, the, the twin doctors that, you, that appear on things like Operation Ouch. They are considered friends of the Media Museum, I believe, because last year they did come and run some of the um, half-term events that were happening. Um, so he's a real-life doctor, along with his twin, Chris, and unfortunately, Xander did catch COVID. You know, they were both working on the front line within the NHS. Now, there has been a TV show on the BBC looking at his journey because it's not been smooth sailing. He has been left with some problems with his heart. And actually, this image on the right is when his heartbeat got so erratic, they had to take him into hospital and actually shock him and temporarily stop his heart to see if they could get it working properly. So for a couple of seconds, he was technically dead to see if they could do this. So he's someone who's fairly young, prime of life, you know, he kept himself fit, he looked after himself. But going forward, he has uncertainty as to what the damage has been done to his heart and what that's going to mean in terms of his fitness. 
so this, his circumstance where he was sick, he was ill, but not life threateningly so. However, he's now over COVID, but moving forward, he has been left with damage to organ systems. And it's these kind of individuals that I'm going to explore the different organs and think about, like I say, the treatments and what that means going forward long term for an awful lot of people that may be in this situation by the end of this pandemic. So this is the offending article. This is a recreation of what the coronavirus, this particular coronavirus looks like. Now it is in a family of coronaviruses. There, it's quite an extensive family. However, there's eight that we know have jumped from animals to being able to affect humans. And I'm going to show you that in the next slide. This particular coronavirus is SARS-CoV-2 and it causes the disease COVID-19. I'm going through these because, like I say, I've been looking at a lot of sources to, to put this presentation together. And I find that sometimes these words are incorrectly used. So just so you get sort of used to them and where their names are coming from. So coronavirus, it, corona comes from the Latin for crown. And as you can see from the images, you can see that these, these spikes sticking up. These spikes being glycoproteins. So that's just a fancy name for something. It's a protein with some carbohydrate attached and it's making these spikes. And these are really vital when thinking about the function of this virus. Viruses often have these on the surfaces because somehow if viruses are going to infect a host, in this case us and our cells, they have to be able to get into those cells. And these spikes... I'm calling them spikes. They're not actually going to physically punch holes in the cell. But what they can do is they can connect to different things on our cells and basically make themselves a door to go through into the cell. If they can't get into the cell, they can't infect it. So these viruses are particularly good at utilising these glycoproteins to enter cells. <clears throat> OK, so where does its name come from? SARS-CoV-2. So the SARS bit means severe acute respiratory syndrome. Remember this, respiratory syndrome. The CoV-2 means coronavirus type 2. So there's not actually that much originality in the naming here. And you will notice that as well when you actually realise where COVID-19 comes from. It's just a shortening of coronavirus disease 2019. OK, so thinking about symptoms of coronavirus, so I've been looking at lots of I've tried to look at scientific peer reviewed articles as the good scientist I am. Um, but if you have a look at symptoms, a lot of the articles are coming out of China and they're from the very early days of the disease because it takes time to get articles into science review journals, for example. Um, and if you have a look at this list, you might recognise a lot of the symptoms as things that we're told to look out for now, certainly the fever and the cough, these top two. However, there is something missing from this list that is now one of the key things the NHS website is telling you uh, constitutes that if you don't have these anymore, they constitute a corona test. So can anyone think what they are? If you can, drop them in the chat. OK, we haven't got listed here loss of taste and smell. And part of that is because people didn't think to look for it. Now, if you have general cold symptoms, you'll often lose some of your taste and smell. And that's just purely because there's that much sort of mucus up your nose that you're stopping the bits of particles that are breaking off of food and things you're smelling actually connecting to what we call receptors, which are things that are on the surface of other cells that can then send messages to your brain to say, hmm, that smells like a delicious bacon sandwich, for example. <clears throat> and that's not even listed here because people didn't know, like I say, to look for it, because actually it's not that common to have the really stuffy blocked nose as well. It, the loss of taste and smell were happening in individuals who didn't have all this mucus production. This is the thing when I read this that really got me interested in the alternative systems that are being affected by COVID. You'll also notice things like the diarrhea at the bottom. Um, that's believed to maybe be as many as one in six people now or even higher it was a very lesser reported symptom, but now it's being reported in more and more people and it's accepted that it, it's sort of telling us that our digestive system's being affected as well. There's other things in here like headache. Something that's just affecting our lungs shouldn't cause us a headache. 
And things like the shortness of breath was at first thought to just be to do with the lungs, but it now could be an involvement of the heart as well. However, these are now the main things we're being told to watch for. So high temperature, continuous cough, loss of taste or smell. So they've kind of been simplified into these are the main symptoms. But the loss of taste and smell is certainly telling us that other things are being affected, particularly our brain. So moving forward, what would I like to look at? Like I say, I want to look at some other organ systems, what's being affected, how they're being affected in terms of what's changing within them. And trying to be a bit of a detective to figure out what on earth's going on and how is something that's it's fundamentally called SARS, severe acute respiratory. Remember, respiratory is to do with the lungs. So how is it affecting everything else? So I'm not really going to talk about the lungs. I'm going to talk about things like the heart, the brain and other organs. And like I say, I'm always keeping an eye because like I say, I wear that clinical sciences hat as well, thinking about the treatment of these people and the extra challenges that this is causing to our medical system. So moving forward, there are some anatomical images of real human tissue. Um, that was kind of almost expected within anatomy talk. I'd like to think that the pictures aren't gross, because um, actually when you look at real human tissue and the way that we do in anatomy, um, it's not all bloody and gory and things. So hopefully they'll be okay for everyone, but that's just a little bit of a warning. Okay, so the heart. So this is a very textbook picture of what you'd see of the heart. The heart essentially is made of four chambers, two at the top, two at the bottom. Because the heart is, anyone know what the heart's role is? If it is, stick it in the function. What does the heart do? You may know it's to do with the blood and it pumps the blood. Okay, the heart is our internal pump that is sending blood all the way around our body. But you may or may not know that it does that in sort of two circuits. So one circuit that the right hand side here is involved in, and one circuit that the left hand side here is involved in. So the right hand side is responsible for collecting the blood that has very little oxygen left because the oxygen has been used up by the rest of our body. It's pumped through this one-way system. These are actually valves. So if you've heard of heart valves, this is what they're kind of looking at and their job is to make sure the blood goes in the right direction into the right ventricle. And then when the heart pumps, it's going to send it up and out this pulmonary artery to the lungs. And on the left-hand side, once this blood's gone all the way up to the lungs, obviously the lungs is where our body takes in oxygen and gets rid of carbon dioxide. So that carbon dioxide is coming out of our blood as well. Oxygen's going in and it comes back down into this left atria. This left atrium. The blood is then sent again through a, another set of valves, these one-way systems of the heart, into the left ventricle. And from that left ventricle, this side you'll notice is much thicker than the right side because the left ventricle is not just sending the blood to the lungs, which the lungs are next to the heart, so it doesn't have to go very far. The left ventricle is responsible for sending the blood all the way around the rest of the body. Okay, in real life, it looks slightly different. It's not quite as nice and neat and laid out as this image. So it can sometimes take you a minute to figure out which bits are which. And in this particular dissection of the heart, you will struggle to see the atria, these top bits, but you will notice the ventricles. So at the back of this heart, so these two that are sort of in the more of the middle of the image, these are the right ventricles. They are smaller and they have thinner walls. And then these are two at the front. These are the left ventricle that's been cut in half. You'll notice they're much thicker. Now it looks like meat because essentially when we talk about eating meat, we talk about eating muscle. And the heart is a highly specialised kind of muscle. Why is it specialised? Because this muscle can't get tired. Our other muscles around our body, you know, if we're talking about our bicep, if you've been doing lots of... Um, picking things up, lots of picking up of shopping bags or um, things like that, then your muscles do get tired. However, our heart muscle, if our heart muscle gets tired and it stops that vital job of pumping blood around our body, you will die. So it is a very specialist muscle. So how's it been affecting people who have a 
who have suffered from COVID. So again, please remember, this is not everyone. These are still rare cases. Um, but I will show you the kind of things that have been happening. So these are two hearts. So they do relate to videos that I'm going to show you. Um, so this one on the left hand side, this is a healthy heart. And I've labelled up the, the chambers. So RA is right atria. RV is right ventricle. Number three is left atria, left ventricle. So remember the atria, those little ones at the top that receive the blood. The ventricles are the ones at the bottom that pump out the blood to either, if it's the right-hand side, the lungs, or if it's the left-hand side, the rest of the body. So I've labelled these up on the pictures. They are slightly different orientations. I apologise for that. These aren't my hearts, so I, I couldn't do much about that, I'm afraid. Um, but if you just compare them, even before I launch the videos, you can see that they do look different. If you look at the structure, look at the anatomy that we can see with these MRI images. So essentially, MRI will be looking at tissues that contain lots of um, fluid, so lots of water, essentially. Um, and if something contains quite a lot of water, it will show up a white colour. If things don't contain lots of water, for example, these big black spaces, either side of the heart on this left hand image is, these are your lungs, which should be filled with lots of air. So you can see that they don't have many white bits, um, whereas the heart is full of blood. Remember, a big, con uh, a big part of the blood is water. These are going to show up white. You will notice this sort of almost white halo around the base of the heart. This is normal. OK, the heart sits within a bag called the pericardium, and that pericardium will have a certain amount of fluid in it. That is absolutely healthy, normal, and that's to do with how it functions and contracting and sort of keeping it lubricated and things. Um, you can see the walls of the heart. So remember that muscle, that muscle that I showed you on the last image. Um, and you can see them and you can see that the left one is thicker than the right one. Um, but if we move to the COVID heart, so this is quite an interesting case of a lady from China in her 50s who had flu-like symptoms and she did test positive for corona. She spent a couple of weeks suffering with these flu-like symptoms and then appeared to recover and she, she didn't have COVID anymore. She wasn't having a positive test. However, she noticed herself getting more and more breathless. So they brought her in and they imaged her body and they may have been expecting to find things with her lungs, but what they found was a problem, well, actually multiple problems with her heart. So again, these are the same numbers as the other one. It's sort of slightly twisted around and flipped over. But you can see that these hearts should be roughly about the same size. This right hand one is slightly bigger, but you can see, for example, the walls of the ventricles. These are much, much thicker. You can also see there's a lot more fluid around this heart as well. So let's see if I can launch these videos um, and show you how they're actually beating as well. Because remember, it's not just to do with the structure. We need to know how these structural changes are affecting the function. And here you can see this heart in action. So you can see the blood coming into these atria, pumping through. You can see these little black things flapping around there, the valves. And you can see this beautiful rhythmic contraction that's happening here with the ventricles contracting. This is a beautiful example of how the heart should function. So if you compare that heart to this heart, I'm hoping you can see that there is such a marked difference in the contraction. So the atria are arguably doing a really good job. The ventricles are hardly moving. Everything's very sluggish, although this will have been slowed down a little bit. But that contraction is just terrible. This poor lady, no wonder she still had symptoms. So this lady on the, the right hand side was finally diagnosed. So her, her fatigue and her symptoms were symptoms of heart failure after the recovery, the initial influenza-like symptoms of COVID-19. So she was diagnosed with biventricular hyperkinesis, which means lack of contraction, which I hope you saw. These bottom, these bottom um, chambers were hardly moving as well as biventricular myocardial interstitial edema, which basically means that there's fluid in all this, uh, this muscle tissue, which like we said, it was definitely thicker, so it's swollen. And then also acute myocardial, uh, excuse me, acute 
myopericarditis. So an infection of this pericardial sac, this sac that the heart sits in, which explains all the extra fluid. So if we have individuals like this who are, are getting symptoms of fatigue and breathlessness and things like that, as a doctor, you've got to realise that it might not just be the lungs. And you have to bear in mind that individuals' hearts may be affected. And particularly if you've suffered with this already, you supposedly have recovered, and then you're having to go back to your GP and say, I've still got symptoms. Your GP needs to make sure these things are being picked up and think about how to to maybe treat someone that's then going to have heart problems for an indeterminate amount of time. If you think about Dr. Zander, he's now got heart problems and they're not quite sure where and how they are going to sort of treat these hearts going forward. Okay, so the kidney. The kidney is another organ that's affected. Um, so this is an anatomical picture of a kidney. So this is a kidney that's been sliced in half. And anyone know what the role of the kidney is? kind of already said it earlier on but just to remind you see who was listening okay we're filtering the blood with the kidney and it does that on a very microscopic level so we have this cortex this outer layer of kidney and then we have the medulla of the kidney and we have what we call pyramids which you can't really see but there are triangles going on in here and basically these are all specialist collection systems that are happening to on the microscopic level filter out our blood so this is the microscopic level so it takes an awful lot of blood or we have a really big blood supply i should say that we're doing this with so Acute kidney damage is reported in 30% of people that are hospitalised with um, COVID and that rises to 50% of people if you're an ICU patient and maybe 5-10% to 10 of these need dialysis. So that's that machine that they're plugged into that will help filter their blood. And you don't normally, if you're having to have dialysis, that's not just a one-off, it's something that you're having to have every couple of days. Now, one of the challenges that I'll go into a little bit uh, in, a, in a few slides time is that wasn't expected in the ICU. They were expecting to need lots of oxygen, but weren't expecting to need lots of dialysis machines. People are also having high levels of protein in their urine. So when they're doing the blood work on these patients that are in hospital, it's coming back that there's high levels of molecules called proteins. And this is also indicative of um, there being damage significant damage being caused. So comorbidities, so you may have heard of these term comorbidities and people with comorbidities needed to shield and so basically it just means people with other disorders if they catch COVID they can often have worse outcomes or they can be poorlier with it. So one of the things that um, was classed as comorbidity was diabetes and whereas I said that the pancreas is an organ that's associated with diabetes, the, the kidneys are also a key organ when thinking about diabetes because diabetes can lead to kidney, fun uh, kidney damage anyway. So if you are someone with diabetes, your kidneys may already have a certain amount of damage. So if you're then catching COVID, um, you are at risk of your kidneys suffering further damage and making you incredibly poorly. Um, people also with hypertension. So anyone know what hypertension is the fancy term for? Blood pressure, or I should say high blood pressure. So it tends to be adults, tends to be older adults. You can often suffer from high blood pressure. And this has also been something that people have said, you know, be wary of if you have high blood pressure and you catch this particular coronavirus, you may suffer quite badly. And again, one of the reasons is because of the kidneys. So the kidneys, so high, high blood pressure, because there is such this extensive blood supply of the kidney. And this apparatus is all very, very... Um, delicate high blood pressure can damage them so you can already have damaged kidneys and then you get a virus that potentially might damage the kidneys further okay so the brain so the brain is considered to be an organ um, that is now being affected by covid like I say going back to that loss of taste and smell that was when people kind of realized oh well if they haven't got all this mucus production Taste and smell is controlled and interpreted by the brain, so it might mean this virus is actually affecting the brain. And we've since realised that it's not just the brain, but it can also be affecting the entire nervous system. 
Now this image on the left is a, uh, is a central nervous system, so this spinal cord and the brain and the peripheral nervous system. So this is one of these awesome images done by Gunther van Argen as part of the Body Works display. So this essentially is all your nerves coming down from the central spinal cord and you can almost see how it maps onto the body. You can see that these nerves down here will be going down your arms. These long nerves down here will be going down your legs. These nerves that are coming out here and then stopping, these are what's um, either sending signals to or receiving signals from your sort of stomach and your abdomen area. So the nervous system looks pretty awesome. But yes, we know that it's being affected by COVID. So this image here is showing you one way of that. And that's that people are um, reporting strokes. So we believe up to 6% of people are suffering forms of strokes because of COVID. And that's believed to be for two specific reasons that I'm going to go into in a little bit but just remember a stroke and what a stroke is is where you've got a burst blood vessel in the brain that blood is carrying oxygen and if that oxygen isn't getting to parts of the brain you start suffering symptoms for example slurred speech if it's uh, affecting an area that would normally be in charge of your speech or you get um, muscle weaknesses for example but other things that are showing us that the, the brain is being affected is things like headaches, dizziness, decreased alertness, difficulty concentrating, the loss of taste and smell. Some people are suffering seizures, weakness and muscle pain. So the delirium where people are getting very confused is believed to be in as much as 10% of patients. So the loss of taste and smell. So this is a dissected head. So this is if someone's head's been sectioned to make a left half and a right half and then turn sideways for us to see inside. Now the surface of the brain I'm gonna show you is where this red line is. And this is called the ventral surface. So this is here. And these arrows are all pointing to bits that are coming off the brain. These are called cranial nerves, and we have 12 sets of cranial nerves. When I studied head and neck anatomy, these cranial nerves were the bane of my life. I used to always get them confused and mixed up and what they did, and I'm still not a massive fan of them. Um, but in this circumstance, the one I want you to look at is this big thick arrow at the top, and this is something called the olfactory bulb. Now, anything that's called olfactory is to do with smell. And now this isn't one of these nerves per se. Like one of the, the things that medical students always do is label this bit that's coming down here as the olfactory nerve. And it's not actually. The official olfactory cranial nerve is a little nerve that's coming out of this bulb and actually going through something called the, uh, the cribiform plate around here. Because this is cut in the side and these are slightly to the side, I can't actually see it. But the cribiform plate is about here, which is... Um, a bony plate's got lots of little holes in and these nerves are going down into our nose because we use our nose to smell so if we sniff little dissolved particles of whatever we're sniffing are going in here milling around inside our nose and connecting to the receptors on this nerve and then these signals can then travel into the brain a bit to tell what you're smelling now, these olfactory bulbs became important when people were trying to figure out why are people losing their taste and smell? Is it just mucus that's stopping these little odorants milling around in here actually attaching or is there something else? Now, I love this story that was published in May. So it's to do with a radiologist. OK, so someone that's going to be in charge of taking these images got coronavirus and they lost their sense of taste and smell. So they actually scanned them. And what they found was that these olfactory bulbs were enlarged. Okay, they did appear to be having oedemas, which is where a buildup of fluid. So you could see that this image on the left is someone that's lacking smell. And this image on the right is someone with normal smell. And you can see that there is a difference. So suddenly everyone went, oh, not only is the brain affected but it's actually it's changing the brain it's altering the anatomy and again we don't know for how long for i have friends that they weren't officially tested as having covid 
but they lost their taste and smell in the fir- within the first couple of weeks of lockdown before, again, it was really publicised that that was one of the key features and they definitely got flu-like symptoms. So we, they are living life assuming they've had COVID and they still don't have their proper taste and smell back. And that was like five, six months ago. Although to be fair, if you're going to have chronic symptoms that last, the loss of taste and smell could be arguably um, less severe than something like the heart problems. But it is still going to affect your life. And I know when I gave this talk to some school children a few weeks ago, someone said, oh, this is me. I lost my taste and smell. I've had COVID. How can they treat it? And when am I going to get my smell back? And I had to say, I don't know, because I don't honestly think people know how to treat this. They don't know what to do about these edemas. And they don't even know why these edemas, so this uh, gathering of fluid in these olfactory bulbs, why these this is causing problems. So it is just a case of seeing how things go and we, fingers crossed, that people will recover within time. Okay, so one of the next systems, the digestive system. Now, it's very hard to show you an anatomical picture of the digestive system because if you ever do anatomy and you open up this um, abdomen, it's, there's... It's an anatomical mess, quite frankly. There is lots of things going on. There's lots of connective tissue and fat in there and things that we would consider things like gristle, um, uh, things like tendons and ligaments and all this sort of stuff going on within our abdomen. So I can only show you a little patch. So the little patch I want to show you is something I've already sort of pointed out. It's the pancreas. Now, this is this yellow structure on the left. We've got this pancreas here. And why I want to draw your attention to that, again, is this idea of diabetes. That Diabetes is one of these comorbidities. So one of these things that if you have diabetes, you are probably asked to shield because we don't, you are more likely to have COVID quite severely if you catch it. Um, Why? So like I say, I already looked into the kidney damage, but it can also be But we think it can be to do with the kidney damage, but it can also be to do with the glucose levels, the sugar levels. Your brain is particularly sensitive to alterations in sugar. Sugar is its basic unit of energy. So if you have a constantly fluctuating levels of glucose or glucose levels that are potentially too high, um, because the insulin that the the pancreas produces is usually what's used to bring the the sugar levels back down to normal, you're not going to be very well. So one of the things they're looking at is really monitoring glucose levels in severely ill patients to see whether if they can use drugs to control that better, that they're going to have a better outcome from these people. But people are finding that if you've had COVID, that some people have got prolonged damage to their pancreas. Again, we don't know if these cells will recover. So you might not have diabetes, you might suffer from COVID, be very poorly and actually be left with diabetes afterwards. Okay, so this organ, does anyone know what this organ is? So I, after studying anatomy for, I've studied anatomy for about 18 years, it was only sort of almost four years ago that I first came face to face with this organ. Now, I'd pretty much say I've seen every other organ of the body multiple times up to this point. Anyone know what it is? It's a placenta. Okay, and the reason why I'd never seen it is because when you study anatomy and you study anatomy on real bodies, the bodies tend to be elderly people that have donated their body to medical sciences. And after you've had a baby, you don't retain the placenta. It comes out in what we call the afterbirth. So I never saw one until I'd given birth to my eldest son almost four years ago and I actually asked the midwives if I could look at it because they have to go through anatomical checks on the placentas as part of the birth progress, uh, birth process to make sure that some haven't stayed inside or it's not uh, abnormal. And they thought I was very high on drugs until I pointed out that I'm, I teach anatomy and I'd never seen it before. So they actually showed me all the checks and stuff. It was fascinating. However... So what does the placenta do? So it's the first organ to form in fetal development. So so when the baby's developing, it's the first thing that forms. And it really does act as the fetus's not only lungs. You might know that 
it's through the placenta that they, they get oxygen and they um, send back carbon dioxide. So it's not only providing what the body need, uh, baby needs, but it's taking away what the body doesn't, uh, what the baby doesn't need anymore. But it's also, it acts like it's gut. So we're talking about glucose and sugars and nutrients and things like that passing over as well. It will also clean the blood so it acts like the kidneys for the baby. So and the placenta is also responsible for many of the hormonal changes. And often the placenta allows a pathologist to look at what the overall general health of the mother has been sort of throughout the pregnancy. Um, because you can see changes within the placenta. Um, and these changes become more evident, for example, when the placenta is older. So it's one of the reasons why they don't like women necessarily going too far over their due date, because they worry about the fact that these changes will start affecting the placenta more and more. So there has been a few studies looking at the placenta to do with pregnant women and the effect that COVID has had on their pregnancies. So these are so this study that I've been looking at was to do with um, 16 placentas of women who caught COVID during their pregnancies. Now, those 16 placentas came from 15 babies that had been born live and one unfortunate miscarriage. So the placenta in these patients have two common abnormalities. Now, they did pick up abnormalities. One was insufficient blood flow from the mother to the fetus. Um, with abnormal blood vessels that we call maternal vascular malperfusion and also blood clots were found. Now we don't know whether these changes, we believe these changes do with the immune response of having COVID. Um, the blood clots could be something else that I'm going to go on to but we don't know whether these changes in the placentas have had an effect on the babies that's the thing even the baby that unfortunately didn't survive we cannot categorically say it was because they had covid um, but it is another medical challenge to think about you know should women who have had covid who are pregnant be offered extra scans should they be looked at more carefully and if they are how are we going to resource that there's only a certain amount of resources and a certain amount of scanning you know if you're bringing women in even though they've had covid there's a chance that they might be passing the virus back to um other family members for example so it's just another challenge to think about how we sort of monitor women that have um, caught COVID, but we don't know how much of a difference it makes. That's the thing. So what's going on here? So we've got all these multiple organs that have been affected, heart, kidney, brain, uh, nervous system, digestive system, including the pancreas, placenta. So what links them all together? One of the things is blood. So like I say, one of those comorbidities was high blood pressure. So the virus is clearly doing something around high blood pressure because you're more likely to have be very, very poorly if, you catch, if you've got high blood pressure, if you catch COVID. The other thing that's happening is blood clots. Remember back to those placentas, I was saying they were finding blood clots. There's, there's a theory that the virus is causing damage to the blood vessel walls. Um, and they are clotting as they should, but then those clots are breaking off and doing damage. So again, from said about the kidneys, one of the other things that were being found within the kidney were blood clots were being found in the kidneys that were blocking up their sort of um, the mechanics within the kidney and how they were filtering the blood as well. So what's happening? Okay, one of the things that's causing people to be so caught poorly is this little molecule this is a cytokine so what's an earth does cytokine mean so cytokine cyto from the latin of cell and kine from the latin of movement and they're small proteins which are involved in just the normal inflammatory response however in covid they seem to get out of control. There's an increased inflammatory response and that inflammatory response itself is further damaging tissues. Now, one of the tissues that are particularly susceptible to what people are calling the cyto cytokine storm is the kidneys. 
So these poor kidneys, you know, they are getting um, damaged multiple ways. These comorbidities tend to have already affected the kidneys. And then the things that are happening in our body's response, whether it be these blood clots within the, the vasculature, within the blood vessels, or these cytokines that are being released because of an inflammatory response, they are yet further damaging, particularly the kidneys. So the common link R is to do with these spikes. Remember the corona that these viruses have, these prote glycoprotein spikes? Okay, these attach to receptors. Like I say, viruses are only good at doing what they do if they can get into our host cells. And they do that by binding to something called ACE2 receptors. And all these tissues tend to have ACE2 receptors on what we call endothelial cells. Now the endothelial cells are sort of tube lining cells and they have lots of receptors on the outside of them, but in particular, they have these ACE2 receptors. So one of the theories as to how, uh, we've, we've sort of had a look at the sort of structural changes and the damage that this virus is, is causing within the body. How we think it's doing that is to do with it getting into the body cells because of these ACE2 receptors. There's also some other theories, I'm not going into this too long, but some of the, the other methods that are being used for research, because actually this isn't that easy to research into. Um, there's been a supercomputer used now. It's the second fastest computer in the world, and it still took over a week um, to crunch this data. But it looked at the fluid from lungs of COVID patients and performed gene analysis. So it was analysed, so they ended up analysing 2.5 billion genetic combinations to have a look at what was the difference in these COVID patients to people who weren't being affected. And again, it's to do with these ACE2 receptors, this is what this computer and the, the gene analysis it performed, it is to do with these ACE2 receptors. And actually the virus is even cleverer than not just targeting organs that have ACE2 receptors. The mechanism it has, the, the organs that don't necessarily produce a lot of ACE2 receptors, for example, the lungs, it's reprogramming the body to make lots of ACE2 receptors in the lungs. So it's it, the, the outcome from this study has shown that it's incredibly clever. Well, clever seems to suggest it, it's thinking, it's not. But it has lots of mechanisms, that's meaning that I'm not surprised it's very good at what it's doing. Um, <clears throat> but this study, I'm not going to go into it in depth. If you want to go into it in depth, you can search literally that term that I've put up, has a supercomputer cracked COVID's code, but also look up a term called bradykinin storm. Now, these bradykinins, again, are molecules, little tiny molecules that, again, are in our bodies normally. And they to do with the um, regulating blood pressure. So again, there's a link in there to that high blood pressure. And it's believed that you end up with lots and lots of bradykinin being released. And also the receptors for the bradykinin being more sensitive. So again, it's a, a two sort of pronged attack here. And the, this massive bradykinin storm can make blood vessels leaky. Um, and so this is causing lots of fluid in the lungs, for example, and mix that with an inflammatory response, you end up with something like a hydrogel inside the lungs. So a, a jelly forming in the lungs almost, which is why if people are being put on oxygen, it's not always being that effective. You can still suffocate with this going on. So I hope you can see that there's lots of structural changes within the body because of this virus. And we think there's some logic as to why that's happening. For example, the fact that the blood is connecting all these, uh, all these organs, all these organs have a really good blood supply. And we're having things like the hypertension is um, exacerbating things. We're having blood clots forming and potentially releasing and ending up places they shouldn't be. This theory of the bradykinin storm is the fact that the blood vessels are getting super leaky as well. So this is why these patients are ending up with lots and lots of problems and that these problems are not necessarily going away for every patient. I don't want to scare you into thinking that, you know, previously you just wanted to survive COVID. And now you realise there's going to be all these other problems. Not everyone gets these. But again, it's keeping track of the people who do. We don't have figures as to everyone who's been affected and who have still got problems ongoing. 
So like I say, with my clinical sciences hat on, I just want to draw your attention to a couple of unexpected clinical challenges that this threw up. So one of them I've always already alluded to, which is the fact that we got critical shortage of the dialysis machines and also the sterile fluids that are needed. Now, this was highlighted in early April and a few weeks later, this was still a problem. And because of the level of kidney damage that patients have sustained, I suspect that careful management of dialysis machines and things like the fluids that are needed are going to be an ongoing issue. One of the things that we did realise was going to be a problem was oxygen, that we needed lots and lots of oxygen and ventilator machines. It has actually turned out that doing oxygen therapy with patients earlier might actually be more effective than the ventilators. So the ventilators being the things that mechanically breathe for us. Um, but one of the things that wasn't expected was the fact that the, the infrastructure of the hospitals was not sufficient um, in terms of the size of pipes. So oxygen needs being piped into the wards. You don't each have a little oxygen canister under your bed. But this oxygen was being piped in, but the pipes weren't big enough. The hospitals weren't designed to deliver this much oxygen to this many people all at the same time. So this again was unexpected. And the third thing is to do with sort of transfusion services, so blood services. So one of the things was maintaining a safe and adequate blood supply during the pandemic. So people weren't going to give blood because it was dangerous. We were shielding. However, we still needed blood and this had to sort of be balanced. So one of the things that was put in place to balance this was um, and sort of mitigate against it was that a lot of uh, non-emergency surgeries were cancelled. So they were, they were balancing that um, to ensure undisrupted supplies. There was lots of increasing uh, communication within the service, etc. However, then we throw in the fact that actually one of the therapies that look like they, it is making a difference is to do with convalescent plasma. Woohoo! You know, there's a therapy that's helping. Brilliant. But it's the same service that's having to help. It's people having to donate plasma. So plasma is the liquid component of your blood. So you don't actually have to take out all the blood and then just take out the plasma. They actually have machines now that, again, will filter your blood and put back in your cells, but keep the plasma out. Um, and there's people that have contracted COVID that are now doing this convalescent plasma donation. But it's one of those things where this service is really on a knife edge of trying to manage and not put all its staff at risk, not put donors at risk, but then also trying to meet the supply because now surgeries are beginning to go ahead, but also making sure that there's enough resources to mean that the, the research into this convalescent plasma can go ahead. OK, so what's the legacy going forward? Now, in Bradford, something's been set up called the Bradford Survivor Clinic. This came about because there were lots of GPs having to see patients who have recovered from COVID, but were still suffering from significant symptoms. So this gentleman, he's... Um, so within the sort of Bradford University and the Bradford Institute of Health and Research, he's very well known, this is Professor John Wright, and he's a doctor and epidemiologist. And he talked to the BBC in this article that I've put down at the bottom about this legacy and brought up the presence of the fact that this Bradford Survivor Clinic has had to be set up. So the gentleman in this second image, this is Dr. Paul Whitaker, he set up this clinic and he said he did it because of GPs having all these phone calls about persistent um, and chronic, becoming, becoming chronic symptoms of survivors. So the two women I want to draw your attention to now is this lady on the stairs and this lady here, this second one from the left. And these are um, NHS workers, the lady on the stairs is a GP, the lady at the bottom is a physio, and they caught COVID and still months afterwards are suffering. So the lady here, this is normally what she does. So she does CrossFit. She's incredibly fit and active. However, these two individuals still months after are suffering from headaches or throats. Um, sorry, that's what they, they contracted. You know, these weren't individuals that were hospitalised. These are the kind of symptoms they started off with. Um, 
And now their norm is the fact that if they walk up the stairs, their heart rate's shooting up to the sort of level you'd expect if they were doing a big, massive gym workout. But also things like memory loss is a problem, particularly for the this physio lady down here. Memory loss and things like anxiety. So this is going to be the legacy moving forward that we potentially going to have to set up these survivor clinics all around the country to help people that have fought off COVID but have suffered potentially one of the anatomical differences that I've shown you and organs have been affected. Okay, so I hope that's shown you some of the anatomy of a COVID patient, so some of the structures that have changed within the body of the different organ systems, what that means in terms of their function and tried to sort of introduce you to why this might be happening although there's not lots of answers right now but also giving you an insight into the challenges that this is that our medical system so the doctors and the nurses and the people treating these people are going to face not only short term but potentially for a long time to come okay thank you very much if you have any questions please feel free to put them in the comments and I will do my best to answer. Okay, thank you.